Daniel looks at the airlines as well, is um, when you look at air demand as a percentage of total domestic travel, um, it's already at a pretty high level of 66% uh, in Brazil. Now that is pretty much where the US is and has been for the last 10 years. Um, so we think the trend has kind of played out to a, to a large extent, I would say. Uh, the contrast is, and I think Fernando alluded to this, is Mexico, where that same penetration is at 34%, and where there's still a lot of opportunity for air travel to gain a lot of share, and part of the reason why we like uh, Volaris. Um, the, the other thing that keeps us comfortable with um, not seeing air taking a lot of share of the intercity bus demand is that um, they can be complementary also in some cases where if air travel starts picking up, people will also need buses on the, on the other end. Um, and the fact that um, maybe two other things would be, one is that the bus travel is still much more competitive, particularly when you're talking about uh, peak travel periods where the air fares really shoot up or when people are buying very close to their travel time. And the last thing I would point out here is that um, there's a capacity constraint with air travel in Brazil. So 65 airports account for 98% of the commercial air traffic, uh, but there's 5,500 municipalities. So you need that bus travel. And we're already seeing some pickup in that intercity bus travel where, where they're most exposed. Cool. So no further questions. I'll hand it over to, to McLovey, who's going to talk about Galicia. Good morning. I am Claudio Pina. I am a, an investment analyst at Inca. I cover the financial companies, utilities, telecoms, and airports. I've joined Inca since uh, I've been at Inca since 2013. Prior to that, I spent five years at Morningstar Equity Research, where my main area of coverage were Latin American banks as well. Before that, I got an MBA from Stanford University. Um, before that, I was a um, an investment banker for Banamex, which is Citigroup's Mexican subsidiary, and we were doing M&A deals all over Latin America. I was also a professor of mechanical engineering for a few years at the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City, from where I have two engineering degrees. I am a CFA charter holder, and I was born and raised in Mexico City. So I'd like to talk to you about Grupo Financiero Galicia, and as Efrain was mentioning, I think this is a good example of how we merge the macroeconomic uh, factors surrounding a company into our investment process, but how it is ultimately the company's fundamentals and valuations that really drive our investment decisions. So Galicia, as you can see in this chart, it is the second largest privately controlled bank in Argentina. It has about 10% deposit market share. And what this is, is this gives Galicia a very good competitive advantage thanks to its access to low cost funding. But in addition, it is the clear leader in credit card issuance. And we think this is a key factor for Galicia because it places it at the forefront of any consumer lending growth in Argentina that we expect to happen. And as you know, credit cards are actually one of the most profitable banking products out there, so it's, uh, it, it should be very good for Galicia. Now, I want to walk you through the timeline, our investment timeline in, in, in Galicia. And um, you know, we've always obviously been following Argentine companies for many years. Unfortunately, for about a decade, the, the economy was tremendously mismanaged, and that resulted in a very depressed financial sector and very low multi-year stock prices. However, in mid-2013, we became very interested because Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner became ineligible to be re-elected president again. That meant that a new president had to come into power in 2015. And when it was apparent that any of the leading candidates espoused a stabilized economy and wanted to do, to, to, to take out all policies that made such an inefficient economy, we initiated a 2.5% position over here in early 2015. Later that year, in November of 2015, we closed the position entirely. Part of the reason was our performance. Galicia had gone up 80% in US dollars, whereas the MSCI at that time had underperformed by 20, uh, had gone down by 22%. 
And we were also finding very compelling opportunities elsewhere in the region, like in, in, like in Brazil. So eventually, Mauricio Macri comes into power and he starts pushing all these reforms, like uh, letting the Argentine peso float, beginning the normalization process for utility prices, and he also reopened the doors for Argentina to tap international markets. However, we waited for more than a year until we saw another compelling entry point for Galicia, and that came in late 2016. What had happened there is now Galicia had been down by 1%, whereas the MSCI Latam was up 28%. So that was another buying opportunity for us. We were seeing tangible evidence that Macri's reforms were having a very positive impact on the economy. And when we looked at Galicia's franchise, it was intact. In fact, during this year, Galicia had won a couple of percentage um, points for deposit market share, meaning it had grown stronger and people were more confident to put their money into this bank. So over the next month, we, we built a 6% position, which we reduced a couple of months ago to 45 and the reason again is underperformance, during, I'm sorry, overperformance. During this time frame, Galicia's price was up 60% compared to minus, I'm sorry, to 18% Latin America. So our overarching thesis for investing in Galicia is pretty simple. We think that as the economy stabilizes, there will be more demand for financial products. One way to gauge the level of bankerization in a country is looking at the system's loans compared to its GDP. And as you can see here, Galicia, uh, I'm sorry, Argentina's loan penetration is 14%, by far the lowest in the region. And that is in spite of having the second highest GDP per capita in the region, second only to Chile. In fact, if we were to adjust penetration for GDP per capita, theoretically, Argentina's penetration should be 79%, much closer to Chile. We choose to take a much more uh, conservative view and assume that in the medium term, about five years, penetration will reach 26%. Now, why 26%? Because that's a level where, level where it was in the early 2000s, before the Kirchner's came into power. So, you know, we feel pretty comfortable saying in five years, with economy stabilizing, loan de loans will reach 26% of, of GDP. Now, more specifically about Galicia is the fact that the Argentine population already has tons of cards in their pockets. As a matter of fact, if you look across the region to the, in this chart, Argentina already has the highest, one of the highest penetrations of cards in the region, 0.8 cards per capita. The problem is that people have not used those cards. Why? Well, because high rates and high inflation have prevented them from, from using them. And when they've used them, it's really only as a transactional tool instead of cash. It's not really as a borrowing mechanism. As you can see from, from the chart to the right, Argentina has one of the wealthiest populations in the region. About 55% of its population is in the middle to high income class. However, they only use a card for about 12% of their personal transactions. So we think there's huge potential for usage or increase in usage in credit cards. And again, Galicia as a leader will be a huge beneficiary of that positive trend. When we look at our different valuation tools, they all point to Galicia being undervalued. First, if we think of a normalized scenario where loans to GDP are at 26%, Galicia would be trading at nine times PE, which is 33%, the 13 and a half uh, times Latin America banking average for, for historical banking average. When we take a longer term view and think what rising to 26% loan to GDP entails, it means that Galicia's loans would go by 35% per year, and that results in a 31% EPS CAGR for the next three years. <coughs> to that earnings level, we apply a fair PE of 13 and a half, and after we adjust for inflation, we get a total real return of 50%, or 14% per year. Compared to its peers, Galicia's three-year peg ratio of four, uh, 0.5 is significantly lower than the 1.3 times average across the region. 
But the other tool that I'd like to highlight is one we developed and we used very early on in the process when we thought that all the evaluation metrics were a little bit unreliable or we wouldn't be able to compare on an apples to apples basis. So what we did is we tried to value the, each bank's deposit market share. And what we do is we calculate the cost of a 1% deposit market share by looking at publicly traded banks across the region, their market values, and then we adjust this price by each country's economy size, so that again, we're comparing apples to apples. And ultimately, if you know, we look at Argentine banks, they're amongst the cheapest ones in the region. And if we just bring the leases price up to the median, or to the mean actually in Latin America, that's a 63% upside. The pricing disconnect is actually even more noticeable because when we think about the potential growth of those deposits, in US dollar terms, the leases deposits we expect will go at 23%, which is more than twice the 10% average across the region. So all in, we think we have an excellent franchise that is set to benefit from a stabilizing macroeconomic environment, but the valuation is very, very attractive. So, that is kind of how we think about Galicia and how we merge the macro into the micro. And um, I can take any questions right now, or um, I'll hand it over to Danielle. Just a quick question. One piece maybe I'm missing. I, I normalized PE of nine, industry average is 13. Yeah. Um, so the some period of time, an expansion of PE plus a 31% earnings kicker. That suggests to me more than a 40% annualized uh, return potential. Because I'm wondering how come that potential can be so low. The, these are, I mean, these are different tools, right? And as long as they're kind of in general agreement, we're fine. These are slightly different, though, in a way. So what we're doing for this is saying, right now, penetration is 14%. How much is Galicia making on those loans? What kind of returns is it making on those loans? OK. Now, we assume that that call it essentially doubles, that return amounts to this amount of earnings. Compared to today's price, it gives you a nine times PE. So that's a very static way of looking at, at, at things. Now, a different tool that we use is, okay, we think that penetration will reach 26% in five years. So how does that directly relate to Galicia specifically through, throughout these years? And, um, you know, just to be consistent with the rest of the portfolio, we use three years. That's a little bit why you see, you know, I'm talking about penetration reaching five years, but 26%, that means that in, in for three years, it'll be 19%, actually. So it's not, you know, the, the same thing. But that means that from where they are now, Galicia's loans grow at a 13, 35% um, annual rate. And then, you know, we, we, we look at market dynamics. I, you know, make adjustments to NIM going down due to competition by 10%. However, there's a benefit of fees being able, uh, banks, uh, Galicia being able to charge more fees. So ultimately, ROEs do contract, but which is, again, where well, you see, you know, 35% growth in the asset base, essentially, versus 31% growth in the earnings. But we get to that level of EPS, and then, then that's when we apply, okay, if the market then will value them as on average 13 and a half, you get to this level, and then we adjust for inflation, which is something we do not do here. That's part of the static uh, analysis. We adjust to inflation to account, again, to make sure we compare it with the rest of our portfolio on a fair basis, and that's how we get to a total 50% real return and or 14% annualized. So, I mean, in essence, what you're saying is you've got these different valuation tools and return potential metrics, and so long as they're all pointing in the same direction and in an attractive direction, you're not so worried about whether or not this one number is considered. Exactly, exactly. Because, I mean, as, as, as you know, and Fernando and Efrain said, I mean, we are not a macro shop. We definitely are not in the business of predicting what level of penetration will be exactly when. So if we get a little bit wrong, we're fine with that. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, you know, we don't lose sleep about that. We would lose sleep about miscalculating the franchise value and actually buying a very bad bank. So, um, so, so that's pretty much kind of what, what you're saying. Yeah, they all point to the right direction. So, hmm? So 
there is some concern. However, it is the, the, the largest banks. Let me go back here. So when you look at this competitive landscape, you have a uh, government control bank who is efficient but really does not make any loans. So they are not concerned on filing any fintechs or any new technologies. But you have a series of very sophisticated, very profitable banks. You have Santander Rio, Galicia, BBVA Frances, and Banco Macro. And they have a huge chunk of the, 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 the market. And they have very big balance sheets. And they themselves are investing tons of money into new, um, new technologies. For example, Galicia now has totally digital um, branches, which I haven't seen in the US, for example. Like, absolutely, you can do everything. My point is that they are investing in these new technologies. They are concerned, but it's a highly regulated market, and they also, all of them together, own the main uh, uh, credit card network, uh, Prisma, Visa. Network. So it's all in their best interest to kind of keep, uh, you know, foreigners, um, I mean, new, ent new competitors at, uh, at bay. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Danielle.